Hi, my name is Jim Heath. I'm the president of the Institute for Systems Biology, and I'm here with Dr. Christina puig Salas and Dr. Tony Rebus to discuss an upcoming paper in the journal Nature that the three of us have. We're all three plus um, folks from Pact Pharma are co-authors on this. Um, as a note, Tony and I are both founders and board members of Pact Pharma. And this paper is actually being published back to back with the second paper describing a related clinical trial that Tony, myself, Pact folks and other collaborators are involved in. So first, congratulations to us. It's very exciting to have these two papers coming out. Um, and um, I mean, it doesn't happen very often when you get to in nature. Um, so Chris, in this paper, you analyzed T cell responses in 11 melanoma patients who were being treated with actually a whole different variety of, of immune checkpoint inhibitors. You know, what was unique about the, about the analysis you did here? So what was unique is that we were able to study the responses and how they evolve over time. And we not only uh, study how these responses were in the circulating blood, but also in the tumor. And the reason why we were able to do that is first of all, because we collected samples, longitudinal samples collected over the course of treatment from tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and peripheral blood. And because also the technology that we use allowed us to use samples that are biologic samples that are relatively small, but the technology is so sensitive that allows us to detect this near habit of specific T-cell responses. So with this, what we were able to do was to characterize what are the T-cells seeing in the tumor, why, what, are, what are they detecting in the tumor, and how these responses evolve over time. I think the data in this paper is actually pretty profound and relatively simple. And so I want to show you um, one of the figures in the paper and maybe just have you tell us what we're looking at. Basically, what we see here first in figure A and figure B is just the evolution of how the tumor uh, evolved in the patient over the course of treatment with anti-PD-1 uh, and TIM3 therapy. And then in the in figure C, what we see is the neapitop-specific T cells that were um, identified in these patients before starting the treatment. So here at, at PBMCs uh, before uh, treatment and also in the tumor before treatment. And, and then how these T cell responses evolve after uh, we started treating this patient. So what we see is that each of these little squares show a neapitop-specific T cells. So these T cells were already present in the tumor and in the, in the tumor here in the second panel and in the circulating blood, and then they evolve over time. So some of these T cells expanded, generating new, 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 new T cell clonotypes that were targeting the same mutations. And then the frequency of these uh, clonotypes evolved also over time, both in the tumor and in the PBMCs. Thank you. I think that is a... Pretty nice explanation of what you see. And, um, and Tony, you know, given that there was a whole variety of, diff of different immune checkpoints used to treat these 11 patients, and that there were also a diversity of responses before the patients really didn't respond to immune checkpoint blockade, um, were you surprised that you could see these types of T cells in virtually everybody? Yes, I was surprised the first time I saw this data. And um, the, these patients were treated with a variety of immune checkpoints, but the, the commonality is that they all received anti-PD-1 based therapies. And there's some patients who respond or not. And uh, the question has always been, why, why is that? And thanks, uh, Jim, to the, to the technology that you first developed uh, at Caltech and then further developed at ISB and, and, and PACT, we're now able to get a landscape view of T cell responses that recognize cancer by making these soluble engagers that are HLA molecules with the mutated uh, peptides. With that, you could see that the data that, uh, that uh, Chris worked us through that by making a library of over 200 of these uh, uh, capture reagents, there were very few T cell responses, uh, very few responses to, uh, to very few mutations. Uh, a handful of mutations were recognized, and they were recurrently recognized over the course of the disease. What really struck me is that this immunodominance, that it's non-random, that it's the same mutations always being recognized, and that even in patients who did not have clinical responses to PD-1 blockade therapy, we could found, find these T cells recognizing their own cancer. 
Well, even in the accompanying paper, which is really a, a clinical trial, but extend that take takes these types of concepts and extended them to basically engineering T cells to rec that are neoantigen specific to recognize tumors. Multiple patients with multiple different tumors were treated. So, and I think these cells were found in that case as well. So, do you think this is general? This is a basically a general baseline immune response that one would expect to see in virtually every patient. I think the positive read of these two uh, uh, two articles together is that even in patients who do not have immune responses to cancer induced by taking away the immune checkpoints, meaning that their immune system wasn't potent enough to recognize and attack the cancer just by taking the breaks out of the immune system, that then we can take the receptors of the very few cells, a few meaning one in a hundred thousand or less than that, but they are there. And we can take their receptors and engineer T cells and give them back to patients. I think that gives us a prospect for treating uh, cancer in a personalized way in the future. And that's why I think it's so powerful to have these two articles published back to back in the same issue of nature. And Chris, do you think, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you on that, of course. And Chris, do you, Chris, do you think that this, um, you know, this baseline anti-tumor immune response that you see in these patients that we're seeing in both these papers, I mean, that, that does seem to be foundational, right? And Exactly. So we always say that PD-1 blockade unleashes the responses that are already present in the tumor. And I think it's quite clear based on our data that you have cells circulating in, in the blood and that you have cells in the tumor that are tumor reactive, but they cannot eliminate the tumor until you treat the, the patient with something that removes the breaks. In this case, it's PD-1, team 3 other drugs that are immune blockade. But I think that the T-cell responses are there. And basically what Tony was saying, if you find a drug that is able to unleash these responses, your patients respond. If you don't find that drug, you still have those T-cells that you can isolate and use them potentially for treatment. And in and, and, and cases, you know, I think is exemplified in this paper and in the accompanying paper, um, and I'll guess I'll direct this to Tony. You have a baseline tumor, anti-tumor response, which isn't often sufficient. When you pair that with a checkpoint, um, you still find that that's oftentimes not sufficient, especially for solid tumors. Once you sort of leave the immunogenic landscape of tumors like melanoma, um, so you know what this does seem to be a promising cell-based therapy for solid tumors. But what's next? I think next is to make um, make this process more industrialized and be able to capture these cells in a in a timely manner, and then gene engineer the T cells, but not only give them the T cell receptor. I think we need to give them more function. So once the T cell receptor guides the T cells into the tumors, that they are don't do not get turned off in there. And I, I think uh, with the, the pioneering work from the, the clinical trial by Pike Pharma opens the way of doing this and uh, um, it paves the way of what it can be retaken in the future to be able to do this efficiently. For me, it's important to think that not every patient is going to have the super strong TCR that we can use, but there's a lot of engineering processes that we can now used to make all these TCRs much better. And I think that we need to work into that direction as well. Yeah, and I think also, you know, as we get smarter about this, we're actually learning more about what makes a good T cell receptor for engineering. Um, you know, we're getting to where, at least for some cancers, those T cell receptors can be off the shelf. There's this non-viral gene editing, which is translates into a major cost savings. I mean, this actually may be evolve into a legitimate um, therapy that can be done commonplace, given time. I, Jim, I, I think you're, you're saying it correctly. The, these articles are the, the ones that tell us that this can be done and it, uh, we can efficiently redirect the immune system to attack the patient's own cancer. Uh, from there, to get clinical responses, we have some work to do. Well, congratulations to all of us, and um, and especially to you, Chris, who you led this work. It's fantastic. Thank you so much.